thank you everyone. Uh, welcome to our panel, which is focusing on new global models in education. Uh, my name is Julia Rosen, and I'm the Managing Director of Global Launch at Arizona State University. And Global Launch is ASU's central training unit. Um, would each of you gentlemen like to introduce yourselves very quickly, and then we'll get right to it? Sure. I'm Ed Fields, the founder and CEO of Hot Chalk. I'm Eric Bonobo, the uh, Dean of Global Affairs at Minerva. I'm Jose Actorinormas Pepe Escamilla, uh, Director of Innovation on Tec de Monterrey at Mexican University. And I'm Phil Regeer, uh, University Dean for Education Initiatives and CEO of Ed Plus at ASU. So as you can see, we have a great group of people representing universities and working with universities around the world. And my first question has to do with asking each of you to compare the state of play as it relates to innovation in universities from five years ago to now. What's the same? What's changed? And let me start with you, Ed, on that. Yeah, you know, from, from five years ago, I think there were a lot of universities sort of asking the question, do we belong online? What will it mean for our school and for our brand? Today, I think every school is asking the question, what to do online? Not should we be there? Um, and, and just in sort of consistent with the theme of, of this discussion, I think schools are also now you know, sort of asking the question, what does this mean for opportunity for our school on an international basis? And, and how do we attack that opportunity in a thoughtful, deliberate way? Mm -hmm. So Jose, um, tech I believe has been online longer than Arizona State University and probably longer than most universities around the world. How, what do you see the last five years? What's the same? What's changed? Uh, well, yes, we have been doing distance education for more than 20 years. I think that first online program was in master's degree in 97. So even the internet in Mexico was not what, what it is. Uh, what I have seen is that change uh, in, uh, in the view for what the universities think about uh, online learning. I think that it shifted from that's not good, it's not good quality, you cannot do what you do face to face, to uh, for some people uh, you can do the same, uh, and some people even think there is even better quality because the interaction you can have, you cannot hide in a virtual classroom as you hide maybe on a face to face classroom with not participating. And I think part of this is uh, one of the good things of the MOOCs hype, uh, which is now arriving to the, you know, the, the, what really they could deliver. It's that it put online learning uh, on the spot uh, for everyone. Eric, have you noticed any changes? Well, I have to say that um, I, I was not in education five years ago. <laughs> um, so what I can say is what I've been noticing uh, you know, being new to the field. I mean, I joined Minerva three years ago, and that was my first education experience. I've been running uh, tech companies or uh, investing in tech companies for uh, 20 years. Uh, what I noticed is uh, quite a, an amazing openness to to change. Now, change is not happening, you know, as fast as <clears throat> it should maybe, but um, I found people to be very open to uh, to a complete change um, of, of the rules of the game, which I, I thought, you know, I thought education is like healthcare. I mean, nothing, you know, it, it changes at, a, at the speed of rock erosion, basically. And, and uh, that, that's what surprised me the most, okay? And then, you know, you, I started talking to people at ASU, and I thought, whoa, you know, they're, they're experimenting like crazy, these people. And that, so, I mean, I think that's the thing that I probably changed in the last five years, but I don't know. Um, but I w I've been very pleasantly surprised. I'm surprised to see by the overall this desire to, to uh, change. yeah, to, to address to address the issues head on because obviously you know there are some. I mean, I've heard there are some issues in higher education. I'm <laughs> yeah, you've read in the newspapers that maybe we're not the most flexible. No, my industry. CEO Ben Nelson is, is telling me. No, he's telling me Ben Nelson that there are issues, and that's why I believe it. You know? Yeah. So Phil, let's go back, what, six years when ASU Online was really launched? And could you talk, you know, kind of a twist on this question, ASU's position uh, within at least the U.S. marketplace in terms of online learning and kind of what's changed? Yeah, so uh, six years ago or seven years ago, whenever. Uh, whenever. <laughs> yeah, like uh, 2009 we had four degree programs and 400 students and now we have something like a hundred degree programs and 20 or 22,000 students and so that's an obvious change. I, I think, you know, we've done a lot but I think that in many ways six years ago was a lot easier. 
uh, in terms of choices because you knew what you had to do. You had to take programs online and you had to grow the student base. Now we're confronted with a plethora of choices around different channels, different things we do, different things we can pursue, MOOCs, not MOOCs, Coursera, edX, open edX, you know. And the choices are much more difficult and, and, I, you know, and I think the tools are at a sufficiently uh, sophisticated level at this point that we're now being constrained by our imagination and creativity in deploying the tools. And I think that's a big, uh, you know, for example, GFA, a Global Freshman Academy, which I can explain, but that's not, it's a huge innovation. The tools were there, and nobody did it until somebody thought of it. And I think thinking of what to do with the tools it is a huge difficulty now. And six years ago, it was few tools, you knew what to do, and you did it. So following up on that, Phil, all of you all use separate technology platforms and sometimes multiple technology platforms. What factors go into your thinking about how to use, you know, which technology platform for which product, do you use one technology platform for everything, how do you make your own, do you buy, you know, can you talk a little bit more about that, Phil? Uh, sure. So, I mean, the biggest, the, the biggest choice probably is choice of platform. And the first question is, is it free or do I have to pay for it? Right? So I like free better than having to pay for it, uh, which is why edX, open edX, Coursera are all reasonable platforms. The difficulty with those platforms is can you monetize off those platforms? And that's difficult and they're at very early stages and we're trying to figure it out and they're trying to figure it out. Uh, but I do think that for global delivery, you're looking at a, kind of a global cloud-based platform that has mobility. Um, and Blackboard doesn't do it. You know, we use Blackboard, we use Moodle, uh, but I do think that the open platforms are um, uh, important uh, and uh, our ability to deploy at scale globally is going to be increasingly reliant on using those types of open platforms. <clears throat> So Ed, what, are you, what have you seen in terms of platform use and how does Hotchock um, approach the platform issue? Yeah, uh, across the student life cycle, you know, we're sort of agnostic about which one is the best. We, we use Salesforce for the customer relationship mm -hmm. management. We had a homegrown one that we developed and invested a couple million bucks in, but ultimately decided that where our opportunity to differentiate on the long term would be is around the data science. and so. Uh, you know, whether our clients are using one application, a, a learning management system like Blackboard, or whether they want to use our version of an open learning management system like um, uh, the uh, 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 Canvas, the open source Canvas. W what we think really matters is how do you get the data, how do you standardize it, what are the data governance requirements to actually do data science that, that can help you deliver better results. Mm -hmm. So Jose, can, can I say yeah, some? I, I'm sorry, I just have Please. to jump here because Ed said something that's really important. Um, I think that um, the platform, it, it, the LMS at least, is a commodity, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't think that the choice of platform is particularly important. The ability to bolt on tools easily is important, and that's where both Coursera and edX are clunky at this point, very clunky. What you don't want to do is build your own LMS. <laughs> that is expensive, everybody thinks they can do it, and as soon as you start doing more and more options, it's, uh, uh, it, it's a waste. We uh, did it in the past, and we more. shut it down. Okay, sorry, Wait, I, I just wanted to add that. Right. 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 I don't think that the choice of platform is uh, uh, agnostic. I think the platform is part of the experience of the student. I think it's important to have a good experience for the student. So Eric, you might have something to say about this. You guys went and did your own technology build out. Could you talk a little bit about that and why you decided to kind of go at it alone? Right, well, I have a lot, a lot to say about that. We only have 40 minutes left. So I'm not <laughs> well, you know, let's um, try to keep it down to like four minutes or less. Wow, maybe okay. Less. It's only the second. <laughs> <laughs> Let me speak, please. Um, so, <laughs> oh, so you can just like elbow him when this goes too long. So um, we are in a we we are in a very um, fortunate situation that you know we're bu we're building something from scratch. So you know um, all all the options were um, open to us, and um, we were really focusing on the pedagogy. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the core of the Minerva approach. Uh, and and part of this was okay. Well, uh, our 
technology platform must support um, real-time synchronous seminars with video, video streaming, right? And so I was three and a half years ago, the product team, uh, it was a spectacular product team, they looked around and they didn't find the kinds of tools that would really support um, our needs in a robust way. Um, in particular, and, and, and video has improved quite a bit in the last three years. And I, you know, that there have been um, you know, improvements in that space. But we needed something that um, um, achieved two things. The integration of uh, video streaming and classroom, so mm -hmm. all of the thing in the same, mm -hmm. you know, in the same tool, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and we also wanted to be able to have the freedom to implement all of the features we, that we wanted connected to the science of learning, the principle of learning that you know we are we've, we've created this list of um, ways of deploying uh, learning um, that you know you we need to have complete freedom to operate. Mm -hmm. and, and so as a result, we decided to uh, build our own platform. Um, and you know, I, I think uh, we have something that really works well, that is very robust, uh, that provides a very intimate experience to the students, which is you know, amazing. It, it's a byproduct. Mm -hmm. it's, that's the funny thing. It's a byproduct of um, thinking deeply about how do we optimize learning for our students. How do we deploy, deliver active learning to the students? And you know, but we didn't find something that satisfied. We were ready to buy. You know, unlike Phil, I don't. I am not that cheap. I mean, I'm ready to buy. Right? So Phil's very cheap. I mean, just, I know. You know yeah. <laughs> just, You're going to find out a happy hour. <laughs> yeah. sure. How cheap I am. So, um, but so that, that's that's the that's the how we ended up with our technology, and uh, we use um, on the LMS side we use uh, um, Canvas, the open Canvas, uh, but we're actually um, progressing toward integrating more and more into the the in-house um, product because everything now is integrated. Now it's easy for us to interface with Canvas with when we're working with other people. But anyway, that's where we're coming from: technology so at the service of pedagogy. So, so yes, yeah, so technology in the service of pedagogy, which kind of goes to the point of why does Minerva exist? In other words, why does the university, why does the world need another university? Are you asking me? I am. Um, well, I, I think there are many innovations, um, you know, in the Minerva model. Uh, so many that sometimes I, I don't know where to start when describing Minerva. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a complete rethink from scratch of how to deliver learning to students um, at a cost that is reasonable and that, um, you know, that will create students that are global and broad thinkers and innovators and leaders, which is kind of the, you know, the high level goals that we have for our students. Easy. So, and I, I think, you know, the reason why I joined Minerva and I had no background in education is because Stephen Gosling, the founding dean, is a, um, a kind of a, a guru of the science of learning and cognitive neuroscience. Uh, as I said, you know, there is no other institution of higher education out there that has actually created its entire pedagogy and curriculum and delivery mechanisms based on what we know about the way that we learn. So would all you guys agree with that, that there is no other institution that has delivered an online curriculum that is consistent with the science of, with best practices of learning Not science? just online, I mean, it's basically the way we teach. Mm -hmm. Like lectures, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's so much evidence that lectures don't work. And yet, mm -hmm. this is still a very prevalent mm -hmm. form of teaching. Well, we, we have, uh, on Tech de Monterrey, we have been shifting away from lectures since 1997. And, uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we have moved away from that. Uh, we don't have lecture halls. We have small groups of around 30 in average uh, students that, that work in project-based learning, problem-based learning, case method, in-service learning. So uh, we have been moving there, and right now we are uh, working towards a bigger transformation of that. If you want me, I, we can talk about that also. I'm, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I want to kind of go back to something that, um, not to be, uh, not to challenge Bill Gates or perhaps John Fallon, but both of them made comments earlier today, kind of implying that um, education technology and education innovation, you know, begins in the United States, and then we kind of export. Um, our innovations to the rest of the world. Um, Jose, could you talk a little bit about the o like the different complexities of the parts that comprise the Tecta Monterrey system? Yeah. 
And then after that, I might ask all of you, are there other examples in the world outside of the United States that either have been imported in the United States or should be imported to improve our own educational system? Well, I, I think that in general, in the United States, as it's uh, seen as successful in education, uh, higher education at least, it's very traditional. And uh, I think that many things have been going outside of the United States. For instance, PBL wasn't invited in the United States. Mm -hmm. or, uh, distance education is much more higher in Canada for the last 20 years than in the United States. The United States had a late arrival for distance education in many other countries in the world. When uh, I can see what universities has inspired us in the last 10, 20 years, I can mention uh, in Europe, for instance, uh, uh, Twente, uh, Aalborg in Holland and uh, Denmark, uh, uh, in, in Asia, maybe uh, Singapore University of Science and Technology, which is a recent university. Melbourne in Australia, Otago in New Zealand. So uh, we have had uh, different sources of innovation. We also look at the United States, but I don't think it's the only way, the only source of educational innovation in the world. I, I, I'm going to disagree with him just okay. a little bit. You know, um, you, you know, have so. <laughs> minutes to disagree. Well, that's okay. No, I don't. I don't want to take that. Time. But I mean, as, as Phil said earlier, um, I think that we have to distinguish the technology from how it's used. And I think what, uh, what Jose is describing is uh, very innovative uses of technology you know, all over the world. Mm. Now, what maybe they were referring to was really mm. the invention of the technology itself, which I think, you know, I, I mean, oh. you know, I am French. Uh, I would love it to say that uh, it all comes from France, but no. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think I a lot of technology. I come on, French uh, also. <laughs> yeah, but I disagree because all these universities, what inspired us was the educational model. Uh, uh, Twente and Albert are not based on technology. It's more sure. the way they structure the curriculum. The students are learning by doing. They're outside of the university solving problems. So they, I think that's the part that is interesting. And in uh, I will say that Spire also Minerva, not, not only Tech Monterey. It's a one, one, yeah. They were one of the pioneers of doing that, and they're really. Uh, it did that before many others. But that's, that's what I just said, in fact, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I think exactly these models are very innovative, um, and now technology can actually enhance these models. And technology, um, I mean, I don't know, but tends to ob overwhelmingly be developed in the US from what I can see. Mm -hmm. Or am I, am I completely wrong? No, I think there's a difference between obviously the raw technologies and having the bulk of venture capital investment and history of developing new technologies and innovations versus educational business models and ways of approaching education, which can be anything that doesn't necessarily depend on technology. But Jose, could I go back and could you walk people through, I'm sorry, Phil, were you going to say something? Go no, ahead. I've been thinking about what to say, but I'm not ready. <laughs> Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Back to you, Jose, then. Um, could you, just for, I, I, I don't think people in the United States understand the complexity and the scale and the scope of the Tecta Monterrey system. Um, I know this, I've warned you guys not to do commercials, I'm, but I'm going to give you guys each a little yeah. chance to do your commercial. Um, could you talk a little bit about the various systems that comprise Tecta Monterrey and the scale at which you all operate? Okay. Well, we have uh, two universities, uh, Tech de Monterrey, which is 70 years old, and Tech Millennio, which is like 10, 10 years old. Uh, Tech Millennio is like uh, aimed uh, at a lower level of, uh, you know, admission uh, standards, etc. cetera, than Tech de Monterrey. Tech de Monterrey is considered an elite university in Mexico and Latin America. Uh, and we have 100,000 students in Tech de Monterrey in 26 cities, 30 campus. Uh, 54,000 of them are undergraduate students. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are in the process of uh, making a big change on our undergraduate uh, process. Uh, Roman Martinez, who is just, just there, is in charge of part of that process related to what we are doing with the curriculum. Uh, we decided <laughs> that uh, if we want, as a of the picture, uh, if, if we want uh, our students to be prepared for the work in which uh, the only thing that will be important is soft skills. Uh, that's what we think, the, the skills of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. The best way to develop those are in real uh, problems, solving real problems. So the curriculum will be structured instead of courses, of mm -hmm. challenges, and they will be solving those mm -hmm. challenges in the industries, in business, and on G's, governments, etc. And there will be learning models attached to those challenges so that they have the knowledge or the information they need to solve that. Those learning modules will be flexible in nature because they will be outside of the university most of the time or many times. There will be some of them face-to-face, -face, but also online, blended, on-demand, adaptive, etc. 
uh, and they will be evaluated or assessed on the competencies they develop on those on those challenges. Mm -hmm. These challenges will be multidisciplinary, and we are not on zero on that. We have started last year. We did uh, week I uh, in August. We stopped classes during one week, and 54,000 students in 26 cities in Mexico went out of the campus with their professors to solve a problem during one week. Those problems were designed by the professors previously, and they have decided uh, if they register in which one of those. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting experiment. I say that uh, what Roman did is a, a part of his work is a, a stress test of the university to see what happens in one week. So this next semester, we will have a, a semester I. The I stands for innovation, for uh, uncertainty in Spanish, is, you know, uh, incertidumbre, research, uh, investigation, et cetera. And uh, that will be a whole semester. And as we are not by competencies right now, but by courses, uh, we are taking six courses of the regular curriculum that the students will be uh, cre accredited after they work and solve that challenge and they develop those competencies and they can show evidence of the competencies they're developing. So that's the model we are moving. So by 2019, it will be in full operation on that model. So that's interesting because you might not know, I believe Tec de Monterrey is the first university outside the United States to be accredited by U.S. accreditors. Yes, in 1947 and so by Sachs. By Sachs. So you're abolishing courses. Just wanted you guys to know that because I thought it was stunning. Don't tell Sachs yet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No reporters in the room. Oops. We're going to burn your notebooks. So, so shifting no, It's interesting. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no. uh, yesterday, uh, one of the speakers, uh, let me remind, uh, the Under Secretary of Education, uh, said that they, he was talking uh, with the uh, accreditors on boards. He cannot um, uh, give orders, but uh, like, uh, you know, recommendations. Mm -hmm. That learning outcomes is the important thing, <laughs> not the proxies that we use right now, uh, like uh, the number of PhDs that you have, the number of books that you have in the library, the number of whatever rooms that you have. Or oh, the credit hours. Or oh, the credit hours. The, the, we call it uh, bottom hours in Spanish. It's the time that you spend <laughs> seated on the, yes. on the chair. <coughs> so, uh, seat time. Seat time. Okay. Seat well, time, so yes. Little, little <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Not so, really. Uh, uh, that, that times are just proxies for learning outcomes. So I think the model that we are moving is um, more um, in, in that direction of learning outcomes. And learning outcomes was a word that was mentioned a lot. Evidence-based learning, also mm -hmm. Bill Gates said this morning. So I think that's a good direction to move. Mm -hmm. I just want to mm -hmm. sort of toss into this conversation about exporting ed tech and mm -hmm. investment in ed tech. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that you know, sort of has stood out for me having sort of gotten into this about 11 years ago was at the learning company in a previous life 20 years ago. Uh, where we were doing CD-ROMs and Math Blaster and Reader Rabbit and that kind of thing. But one of the things that's really sort of stood out for me, and I don't think we're getting at with the technology deploy, and I think Bill Gates spoke to this a little bit, faculty matter. Um, technology is really not going to displace, uh, we don't believe, technology isn't going to displace faculty in a big way, in the same way that it has in other industries. Mm -hmm. And so somehow we have to find a way to to bring technology to, to bear on helping teachers be more effective, helping them meet students where they are, um, and, and helping give them some time back. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally help them you know, sort of be, get more done with less and, and at the same time drive outcomes. Okay, so now I think I can kind of formulate what I was gonna say earlier. Um, I think that Minerva is an unusual example of the co-development of a tool and a curricula. The learning ecosystem is built around the tool and the tool is built to support the learning ecosystem. What happens in the US is somebody goes out and builds a tool, it's placed into an ecosystem where it may or may not work and we spend not enough, not sufficient time developing the ecosystem around it to make it most effective. And I think what Jose was talking about is exactly right. Whereas the tool may be developed in the US, at Silicon Valley or somewhere else, then what happens is the sales force goes out and flogs that tool and in American universities. It's like, and it's hard. But the deployment of the tool effectively often is done much better in international settings than it's actually done in the US. I don't know why that is, but it may be that there's more necessity. 
to use that tool effectively in other areas. And it's just, you know, it's a big world out there. And there are a lot of different cultures and a lot of different ways to do things. And we're finding out more about effective deployment of tools that are developed internationally, perhaps, than we are within the U.S. Mm -hmm. Fair? Mm. So that's a great segue. Um, Ed, uh, you received a stunning, you, Hotchuck, as leader of Hotchuck, has received a stunning investment of mm. $230 million mm. from Bertelsmann. Mm. And happy that, hour. Yeah, well, A, you're buying. I got happy yeah. hour. Everyone's yeah. invited. <laughs> Everyone's invited. Even if we can Phil, start now yeah, if you want. Even if Bill falls <laughs> off his chair, you're still buying. Um, uh, but let me ask a question that I think everyone's asking. It's like, how do you get $230 million? What kind of vision? What do you articulate? Come on, uh, like, did it tell us. Happy yeah. hour. Tell us. Yeah, yeah. Ed, Ed, how do you get so, it? So. <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, uh, look, we have a, a really big, long-range horizon belief in the notion that, you know, platforms like Hot Chalk are going to be adopted you know, sort of widely to support the non-academic portion of the student life cycle and that data science is going to be really critical. Now, we also believe, and I, I spoke about this a little bit at lunch, I'm not sure how coherent I was, but, <laughs> but we also believe, you know, sort of deeply in the notion that this is a very large market opportunity mm -hmm. and scale will in and of itself be a competitive differentiator. So if you believe in those two things, you really have to come armed for bear and ready to, to, to grow and you know, sort of seek scale in a, you know, sort of a very aggressive way. Um, so that's the reason why $230 million you know, sort of made sense. Uh, how to do it is another uh, question uh, entirely. <laughs> um, I can tell you that it took a long time. I, I mean, we worked very hard at it for eight months, although it would also be true to say that for the seven years leading up to that financing, a tremendous amount of work went into proving the vision and demonstrating that you can produce great outcomes for students online and that you can make a company around the whole idea that it's about graduation, it's not about enrollment. Uh, uh, the, the, the funny thing about it, uh, uh, or the odd thing about it is, you know, life before a financing completes feels like it's going to be, uh, is, is very stressful. I mean, you know, you're, you're running this company and you've got to make sure the mm -hmm. tank is fueled and, and, and you're building. Oddly enough, and I've raised, you know, sort of money before for several different enterprises, but nothing at the scale of $230 million. Oddly enough, boy, after the money hit the bank, I, I, the pressure went up. It didn't come sure, off. I sure, mean, I, you know, sure. the, the, the responsibility to, to successfully and effectively deploy that kind of capital, uh, you know, is, is front and center for the leadership team at Hot Chalk on an everyday basis. And we feel a sense of responsibility to the marketplace and the, the universities and students we serve to be great, um, you know, sort of given this, this, this moment and the, the financing outcome. Yes, well, we, will, we would all love to have that pressure, Ed, and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Phil, could you talk a little bit about a new alliance that Arizona State University has made with uh, King's College London and University of New South Wales? Yeah, it's fair to ask why I'm on this panel in the first place, right? Uh, ASU Online, last time I checked, we had like 400 international students, and most of them were Canadian. Um, but we recently announced uh, in February the development of what's called the PLUS, which stands for Phoenix London University Sydney. So Phoenix London Sydney University Alliance, but PLSU doesn't spell anything, so we <laughs> rearranged it. Right? And it's, a, it's a, an alliance with uh, King's College London, University of New South Wales, and Arizona State. And it really has kind of two pillars. Uh, there is obviously a, a, a knowledge network which is built around large research questions uh, uh, related to uh, uh, accelerated technology deployment, healthcare innovation, engineering, uh, photovoltaics, those sorts of items, sustainability. But then there's a global learning network. And the global learning network really has two things going on. First off, each of those three universities has made a commitment um, to the development of highly effective online courses. And as a result, it's now possible uh, for those courses to be traded across the university. So 
Going forward, ASU, for example, we do not have a petroleum engineering program. We won't develop one in the future. What we'll do is we'll work with University of New South Wales, which has petroleum engineering, to pipe that into our students. And right now, you could think about it almost as study abroad, where the students are able to participate, for example, in a course with King's College students while they're at ASU using online technologies. And we've worked out the platform, we've worked out how those credits will swap, and we've worked out the tuition reimbursement and everything else. But the more important element of this is being able to deploy the assets that have been developed around digital learning technologies at scale to begin making a dent in the demand for higher education in parts of the world where the demand for higher education far outstrips the ability to supply it in the near term. And if you think that, um, you know, that, 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 that the U.S. is insufficiently built out in higher education, which was a point President Crow made today, it's nothing compared to parts of uh, different parts of the economy. And everybody could, the easiest one to point to, you can look at all the BRIC companies, but just look at India, where the demand for higher education is expected to increase by 30 million people a year each year for the next 10 years. I'll let you process that. Okay, that's 300 million people entering a higher education market over the next decade, okay? Now, there's no way, there's no way that you can develop high quality educational institutions at that rate, certainly not brick and mortar, perhaps not even online. And so what we're trying to do in the PLUS Alliance is be able to put together a consortium of universities deploying 10,000 research grade faculties at scale to begin offering opportunities, working through a conduit, it might be a university, it might be an NGO, it might be a government, it might be a company like Intel or like an education company like Pearson or an education company like Hotchock to be able to deliver at scale solutions that make sense and a price point that makes sense in those parts of the world, as I said, where the demand for education far outstrips the supply. So this might be the answer to the question, but if I'm sitting in India mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, gosh, how do I solve my problem of educating 300 million people, you know, is my first call going to be to an alliance of an American, a British, and an Australian university uh, versus looking locally in my own market for innovators? Can you speak a little bit more to that? Well, I think the answer is no, because you probably don't know about the PLUS Alliance, but if you did, <laughs> we would hope that you would. Oh, I've got to call the PLUS Alliance. I mean, that is the response we want. Oh, I've got to call the PLUS Alliance. I've got a problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, look, the idea is not to displace the development of education, educational institutions anyway, anywhere. And the fact is, like King's and ASU and University of New South Wales, if we offer our online degree programs at the current, at kind of Western prices in India, like we, we get no uptake, right? So what we have to do is figure out a way to work with a partner to greatly reduce the price of what we're doing so that it can be offered at scale. And again, the opportunity is extremely high quality content created by faculty who are all at institutions who, as President Crow today said, have knowledge at the core and who have, you know, who, who are willing, ready, and able to work with other implementers in those mm -hmm. foreign countries. That's, that's the big issue, right? I mean, it really is about how are we going to deliver at the scale that the planet requires. I mean, the, the, the single greatest driver for change in any you know sort of non-industrialized nation or even you know sort of the BRIC countries, it's education. But the question is you know sort of how do we get this mm -hmm. done in a meaningful way at scale that really we've never considered before mm -hmm. uh, as an education you know sort of ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's the great challenge. It's it's also the great opportunity. Mm -hmm. So, Jose, last time I saw a map of South America that was produced by somebody at Tecta Monterrey, there are all these dots throughout Latin America, Tecta Monterrey satellites throughout South America. Could you talk a little bit about that network and what you seek to accomplish with that and how that is helping tech advance as an institution? Well, we, we have been very active in Latin America offering uh, online and off-campus uh, programs. Uh, uh, I think that uh, when, when I heard what you said, uh, it reminds me of a conference I was uh, four years ago uh, with our, offered by a vendor. We don't, we're not a client. It's similar, I think, to what you do. Yeah. 
and there were two candidates for the presidents there and uh, two former governors, etc. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that the United States market was saturated, uh, higher education market, and that the uh, online learning was ready to take over the world. So the United States will take over the world. <laughs> I, I personally, I don't think that will happen. Uh, uh, <laughs> because I think that context is very important. Of course. Uh, and so I think that local universities have an opportunity. I would be more afraid that Indian universities that have this need develop something that will be really cheap, really good, that will take over the United States markets. I think that it can be on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So if I was uh, uh, an Indian, I think I would not be as scared as the United States could be because there are lots of Indians that speak English also, uh, mm -hmm. which is also an advantage. You have all the call centers right now. You, you have to just level up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and there are very good people in India also. They produce very good engineers, uh, businessmen, mm -hmm. etc. cetera, all over the world. So uh, I, I will be cautious about that. And I think that context is very important. So coming to your question, uh, what we have done is partner with local institutions when we can, yeah. as mm -hmm. uh, the much that we can to mm -hmm. partner so that we can somehow localize and also uh, put our brand with a good brand also in that country that they know that is good. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, uh, penetration of that market is better and we are not seen like a, an outsider in that country. Mm -hmm. So Eric, Minerva is a U.S. university. Um, that involves, if I'm understanding correctly, people, uh, students being admitted and then they start their education in San Francisco, then go to six cities around the world. And if I also understand this correctly, 80% of your students come from outside the United States. Can you talk to us about, was that intentional? Why is that the case? Uh, what kind of demand are you guys tapping into that other people aren't? Could you just talk about that? Okay, well, yes, that's true. 80% um, uh, um, of our students uh, come from outside of the U.S. Um, it was not intentional, but I think it was kind of expected because the sweet spot is, um, you know, this uh, huge reservoir of very smart kids all over the world who are very interested in, um, in higher education in the U.S. for whatever reasons, you know, good or bad but there is a, a deep interest in higher education mm -hmm. in the U.S., particular, you know, uh, undergraduate degree, uh, liberal arts. Um, and what we said was, well, okay, we're going to create um, a very uh, selective um, institution, um, and we're going to, um, you know, we're going to have you take a test, in a way, or a series of tests, and if you pass, you're in. And there are no quotas. That's basically, we don't, we don't look at where you're coming from, or, you know. Um, and, and uh, that really uh, created a lot of uh, interest and demand in various countries in the world. So I think that's, if you look at, you know, the, the difference between um, the number of foreign applicants to Ivy League schools mm -hmm. and the percentage mm -hmm. of undergraduate students, you know, who come from foreign countries, mm -hmm. I mean, it's such a gap. Yeah. And it's not due to the fact that they're, you know, less smart or it's just, you know, it's part of the, the way that the system works, mm -hmm. and um, so we're saying no, we don't. You know, we don't care about that. So, as a result, we ended up with 20 percent Americans, which is great. I mean, it's, it's, and you know, and and we did not expect anything. We don't. We're not trying to create any constraints or anything. So, for example, we also have a, um, you know, a gender, not imbalance, but uh, you know, we have about um, 40 percent male, 60 percent female. That was not something that we planned or anything. It mm -hmm. just happening and maybe it will change and fluctuate over, over time, which is to say, okay, mm -hmm. take the test. Mm -hmm. um, so Jose, um, tech is a fast moving place and you've talked about this new tech uh, Beidou 21 model about moving towards a project-based curriculum and with all the different systems and your partnerships, um, how do your faculty respond to all of that? I think we can all agree that you know, the role of the faculty, the role of teachers will always be central. How, how do they deal with these new ideas that come through the president or do they generate these ideas? Because the rate of change, I know people think Arizona State University, that we operate at scale, that we change quickly. Oh, what are you doing now? You know, people are always asking us this. Um, but compared to tech, I honestly think you guys work at a much higher rate of speed and a much greater scale. How do your faculty deal with that? Uh, well, uh, I think that we are not starting uh, on zero. We, we started in 1997 changing mm -hmm. the model. We are now transitioning to a, the, the next step will, will be an, a new model that not only changes what we do in the classroom, but also 
outside of the classroom and, and not by courses but by competencies and challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say also that the ADN of the university, the DNA, uh, DNA, <laughs> yes, that's what I'm Spanish. the DNA of the university is uh, also very entrepreneurship uh, because we were founded by entrepreneurs in, in Monterrey, Mexico 70 years ago and we are not managed as other universities. I would say we are like a strange animal in the university, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, repertoire. So uh, uh, we are, that's, I think that's one of the reasons that we can implement uh, fast changes. I will say that compared to other universities, we have a large number of professors that are unwilling to try early adopters or fast adopters of things. Uh, maybe 30% of our faculty are willing to work or, or to participate in, in, in what we do. Uh, we counted in the last uh, uh, four years, 1,500 professors have been uh, active in an innovation, educational innovation project, finance or not, mm. uh, out of 8,000 professors that we have. So that makes a large number of people, and I think that's a great advantage. So are we, we are uh, uh, on, on the, on the, on the on, how do you say, on the, on the shoulders of gigants. So we're <laughs> constructing on what other people have constructed in the university. And I think yeah. that's why we make it possible. Ed, you all partner with uh, traditional or traditional universities mm -hmm. to help uh, expand their scale and their scope. When you choose to partner with someone, what kinds of markers do you look for? Either good signs or what kinds of warning signs? Sure. You know, how do you select your partners? That's a that's a really important question, and it's it's critical to the success of the the business model. And, it, and in some ways it really gets to the question you were asking about what's the role of faculty and the rate of change and uh, the, the, the single most important thing to us during what we refer to as the due diligence process with a potential partner university, them looking deeply at us and us looking deeply at them, is really clear alignment between the administration mm -hmm. uh, and the faculty. We simply cannot place multi-million dollar bets on, and make multi-million dollar investments on universities where there's any inconsistency between, you know, sort of the faculty and the administration on both the near-term vision and the long-term vision. Our, our typical contracts run at least a decade and, and more typically like 12 years. So, you know, for us it's making certain that the university partner uh, is aligned within itself around the vision for execution and, and that everybody's all bought in and ready to go. Gotcha. Eric, um, something that Ben Nelson mentioned, uh, Minerva CEO today at lunch, um, he talked about the incredibly low acceptance rates that Minerva has and there was a recent article in whatever Inside Higher Ed that also spoke that you're acceptance rates are even lower than those of the Ivy League schools. And of course, full disclosure, I come from an institution that we say we measure ourselves not by who we exclude, but by whom we successfully include. So was, talk to us about this rejection thing. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? How do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> look. <laughs> We live in the in the in, in the sad world that has been, uh, you know, templated uh, by U.S. News and World Report. So you know, it turns out that this is one of the metrics that matter. Mm -hmm. But we all know here that there this is meaningless, right? It doesn't mean crap. So that's it, you know. So now it turns out it was the, the, the cover story in the Financial Times two weeks ago. Um, and, and you know, the, and the journalist focused on that because, and Ben likes to talk about it, but then in private, we'll say, it doesn't matter, you know. It's actually, we would like to have a much higher acceptance rate, which would mean that we are reaching uh, the right crowd because we have 16,000 applicants and we're taking 300. Mm -hmm. It means that, you know, we're, there are 15,700 applicants that are not relevant to, to us, or maybe only, only 15,000 are not relevant to us, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I would, I would love to have a 30% acceptance rate. I mean, it would be great. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that, you know, and, and, and when you look at um, where our students come from and, and through what channels and everything, it's all over the place. That there is no pattern that emerges yet. And so we have to 
be very, very broad in how we reach out to people all over the world. And that leads to this low acceptance rates, but it's sadly not a badge of honor. It's, a, it's meaningless, but it's a very nice advertisement. And so perhaps Ed can give you 100 million of his 230 million so you can serve you know, a lot more of those students. Uh, Right. Well, I mean, we aspire <laughs> to become Frank Bruni's uh, zero percent acceptance rate. You know, and that increases your funding and everything. <laughs> I actually think this is this is the, the 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 existential question for the entire higher ed ecosystem today. Um, and and the very first time I heard this phrase that ASU measures itself not by who we exclude but by who we successfully include. Mm -hmm is when I really sort of got bought in to the ASU story. And, and it was actually said by Michael Crow at a dinner five, seven years ago or something like that in a, in a very small setting. Um, look, at, at one point, university was really a social sifting mechanism, right? I mean, you would send your kids, if you had the money, to university, depending upon how academically you know, sort of talented they were. They might get into one of the Ivies, but they would go to a university and they'd blow your dollars. I have four kids, two in university, you know, uh, today, so I have a little experience with kids, you know, sort of blowing money. But, but it's no longer, that, that's no longer the case. I mean, in order to compete in the economy that, that everybody's in today, you, you have to have more than just a high school diploma. And we started talking about that as a society, you know, back in the early 80s, maybe more around the early 90s, the great challenge that we face is that you know we, we basically told everybody to make deposits in a 529 account. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we told every parent that you've got to get your kid ready for university, and the, the number of first-time you know sort of attenders from families that haven't been at university is exploding. Mm -hmm. I sit on the board of trustees at UC Merced, which 60% you know, of the kids are first-time attenders. Th this is the existential challenge for the system. Mm -hmm. we, we have to find a way to make it work for kids across the entire, you know, sort of academic capability list, but, but more importantly, the, the, you know, the economic levels that, mm -hmm. that people come from. Uh, it, it can't be about excluding people. It has to be about successfully delivering and creating education outcomes for everybody, and, and it also has to be everywhere, including the rest of the planet. The, the only path to a more prosperous, peaceful world is, well, is education, and, and, and I think higher ed is, is really the icing on the cake and critical to success. So going a, a little bit uh, deeper into that question, Phil, could you talk about how ASU thinks about measuring impact? Because you were talking about broad themes. Well, what types of things uh, do you look at? Yeah, so uh, we're uh, aligned with that on a, on a number of ways. Uh, we certainly believe that uh, graduation is, is kind of the key. A credential is important. Graduation gives you the credential that you need. Um, and increasingly, I agree with Jose too, it's going to be increasingly outcomes-based. I just want to make kind of a comment. You know, I, I, there is a place, it, it, I mean, it, it goes back to these kind of Greek academies. There's a place for those, and, and Minerva is a spectacular school, and they're doing great things, and I envy their technology platform. We, we, we have a problem though, and, and, and it's not gonna be solved, I think, 30 students at a time, unless I can do it 30 times, 10,000 times, right? And a lot of our issues are how to deliver um, something at scale uh, that, that is, uh, uh, solves the problems in the communities in which we operate. And that could be inside Phoenix, it could be inside Arizona. Certainly there's a national community in which we operate, but increasingly, we all, and I think everybody in the room agrees, that we all have to be world citizens. We all have to take responsibility, not just for what's happening in Maricopa County, but oddly enough, increasingly what's happening in Kabul, Afghanistan, as an example. And to the extent that we can um, uh, mesh some of our learnings together with the culture inside a country and, and, and work with a university uh, that may not have the ability to develop a highly effective electrical engineering program, but they have a catchment area. That's something that we want to do and that, that, that we feel a responsibility to do. And so impact for us is increasingly about scale and outcomes and a credential that typically involves an undergraduate or a graduate degree. 
Well, we have less than a minute left, so very rapid fire. Could I ask <coughs> each of you to say in just a few words something either about your company or about the education innovation field that you're really excited about? And I'll start with you, Ed. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm super excited about the, the opportunity to, to drive and deliver at scale on a, on a global, you know, sort of level. Um, we have to push this product, higher ed from the United States, out beyond our borders, and we're now in a position to do it in a way that simply wasn't possible before. I think this will make the world a more cohesive, peaceful, and, and prosperous place, and, and, uh, and that's something to wake up in the morning and go do. Eric? I'll speak very fast. Um, <laughs> our, you know, our, our goal is peace in the Middle East. Um, I mean, it's tongue-in-cheek, but I think that's the way that we view our contribution. Now, the, the elite mm -hmm. institution that, we've, that we're building is the tip of the iceberg. You know, mm -hmm. um, the, everything, the entire infrastructure that supports it, you know, we want to then bring it to as many students as possible all over, all over the world. And, you know, that's, that's why I'm in it at this point. Jose? Uh, I think that we are living on the best of times for higher education because uh, all the planets are aligned for change. Uh, there's pressure from a financial point of view, from the parents, from the students, because they aren't obtaining what they want. You know, the technology is there. Uh, it wasn't there maybe a few years ago. And uh, we are, don't know exactly to what world we are going to prepare our students, because we know that uh, the kind of jobs that they will get will be very different. Mm -hmm. So uh, that uh, it's uh, mandatory for all the universities to rethink what we are doing in, uh, in education. So it's, uh, it's uh, the best of times. Excellent. Phil. Um, I'm very, very interested. I think over the next five years, we're going to become, Arizona State is going to become an increasingly globally focused institution. And I'm very, very interested in figuring out what works that we haven't invented and bringing it back for the improvement of students at Arizona State and in the U.S. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.